We are recording. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, why don't you uh, uh, show us uh, uh, what you've been doing with the uh, hashgraph uh, in Rust? Sure. So, <laughs> all right, let me uh, show you like for five minutes the old project and then I'm gonna have to switch over to my other computer because I haven't actually uploaded the new one to GitHub yet. Uh, I think it's okay. So yeah. Uh, also, after um, Isaac recommended that I do a visualizer, I ended up doing one in D three. I can show that on my other computer too. But basically, this version of a uh, the algorithm, you know, it's written in Rust, so I was able to convert it to WebAssembly and have it run in the browser, just like easy to get consensus in the browser. That's one of the nice things about Rust. Um, but anyways, I hooked it up to D3.js and got kind of this visual graph here that you can see. This is just a picture, but I can pull up the actual uh, uh, running in the browser on the other computer. Um, yeah, so when I did this implementation, um, I, I did it very specifically to the declarative logical way that they describe it in the paper. They kind of describe um, four different uh, kind of ideas in Hashgraph. There's the idea of seeing, strongly seeing, a witness and famous, where famous is the concept of finality. So when an event is famous, then it's finalized. Um, and so it's, it's kind of like events go through these four different stages. And um, the first three are actually immediately detectable when, an, when a, an event is created. So you can immediately tell like what, uh, what events another event can see, which is basically just like reachability through the graph. Uh, you can see which events an event can strongly see, and you can see if an event is a witness or not, which is just up to a certain criteria. Um, and then the famous comes later once enough events have seen it. But in this implementation, uh, since I stuck pretty strictly to the way the paper describes it, I have these definitions, like we can start with seeing. They're strongly seeing. Um, we're seeing. Hmm. Maybe I give it another name. <laughs> uh, let's see. Oh, it's probably ancestor. Yeah. So ancestor is the same concept of seeing. Um, and let's see if I have a hash graph swirls consensus. Let me pull up the paper. Hmm. Sometimes their paper is like randomly hard to find. Uh, some papers are like that. Hatchcraft's world's consensus paper. There we go. Yeah, so just as a reminder, this is what the hash graph looks like, um, where each line is a passage through time for one validator. So in this uh, consensus group, there's five validators. 
uh, each with a genesis event at the bottom here. And um, the idea is just that when an event or, or rather than in a normal consensus algorithm where you deliberately send uh, a message as a vote, in Hashgraph, all you do is you gossip. So you randomly send events to other nodes that based on their structure will tell the other person everything that they know. And the idea is if you can randomly gossip uh, everything you know to another random person quick enough, then over time you'll approximate um, a complete view where everybody can see. Oh my God, can y'all hear my cat right now? Yeah. Yeah. Cat, what do you want? She just likes to, you know, yeah. Uh, want some attention. Yeah, exactly. I'll be back <laughs> in a second. Sorry about that. No worries. Cool. Well, um, yeah. So I don't know if y'all remember that Hashgraph algorithm very well or not, or if I'm kind of just preaching in the choir. Yeah, I actually, I watched a video, the YouTube video where the, uh, the, the author or creator uh, walked through that is about 20 minutes or so. So, and that helped me kind of prepare for uh, a month or so ago when you, kind of went when we went through as a group through the hash graph so yeah you know this idea of gossiping and gossiping about gossip and so i i still it's still kind of there so yeah cool all right so that's good so this is all looking pretty familiar to you okay well okay yeah so that's the basic premise of it so if we look at like ancestor function um you know you iterate through uh, the entire graph, you're seeing if X can see Y. And so you're iterating through the entire graph and checking each hash to see if it's Y. Um, so, I mean, this is an O of N operation right here. Now, if we look at strongly seeing, which is the next second step criteria that we evaluate, basically whenever we add a new event to the graph, we're going to determine if it's a witness uh, and therefore figure out which round it's in. That's how we figure out the round is by determining if it's a witness. And so to, a, an event is a witness if it can strongly see two thirds or, or if it can strongly see witnesses by two thirds of other validators. Um, okay. And so to strongly see something is to see another event or it is to see two thirds events that can see another event. So you see, we have all these recursive definitions. Mm -hmm. So when I wrote the code, I wrote it literally like that. I wrote uh, strongly seeing means to iterate through each event and see if I can, if that event can see this other event. So all of a sudden this would be O of N squared plus this login for insertion uh, so it, it quickly gets complex and then when you're figuring out the witness, I'm pretty sure this is like a high polynomial, uh, you know, complexity time. And, you know, after just maybe a hundred nodes, this thing was like crawling. So that's why I ended up rewriting it. Um, all right. I got to switch over to my other computer to show the new code. So okay. I'm going to sign off for a yep. minute. All right. All right. 
Hey. Okay. All right. Can you see my screen again? Yes. Cool. All right. Let's see. So yeah, this is the new project. Um, yeah, so in this one, I uh, was inspired by something called data, data-oriented data design. Um, uh, have you heard of that before? No, I'm not familiar with that. It's like... Um, I haven't heard about it either. Okay. I mean, the, the basic principle is just that you want to design your, your code by the data that you're working with. Um, which Rust already tries to do to a certain extent. So like Rust is not object oriented in the conventional sense. Um, and one of the biggest things that they try to remove from your standard object oriented practice is um, the coupling of behavior to data. So like when you write a class, you'll define all the fields of that class inside it and also all the methods at the same time. So you've now inherently coupled all the methods to the data. Um, but in reality, you want to write the most general uh, functions that you can when you're writing code. You know, that's what Haskell has with all these higher kind of types and stuff. Mm -hmm. So how, how, how does uh, class relate to type? Uh, classes. Well, when I say class, I mean class like in Java or C++. Like uh, a class is a usually a way to describe or encapsulate some some notion in programming. I you know, got you. Yeah, it's not, not like a type class, which is a, a different kind of polymorphism. Um, there's, you know, there's like inheritance polymorphism and then there's, uh, what would you call it? I guess like traits using type classes or traits and then that's like two kinds of polymorphism and people today kind of shun the object oriented inheritance approach. Right. Because all, yeah, all inheritance is really doing is allowing you to literally reuse code almost like a copy and paste. Um, and you went down this uh, strategy, or you created the strategy due to the, um, the, the, the slowness issue that was created in your first draft of, of the code? Was that yeah. the incentive? Yeah, that was the incentive. Um, I was trying to figure out how I could most easily just access all the data that I needed at any given time. So before I had a concept of an event, it was a structure. You could almost think of it like a class. And each event uh, had its own transactions, its own self-parent, other parent, uh, hash ID, and you would just store a list of events. And so you could iterate through them and pull out the data from each one that you would need. But in this design, I instead have just this struct called graph. And graph has a, uh, a list of self parents, a list of other parents, uh, a list of transactions. It's in uh, relational terms, it's kind of like having uh, or transposing the data. It's like changing it from uh, a, a, a list of structs to a struct of lists, if that makes sense. So this is all the same things that I had in the um, event structure, but now they're all vectorized out. So this graph, this, this vector of other parents, uh, each index is uh, representing one event. So that's the case for all of these. So this graph right here is storing all the events in the graph and each index represents one event. Okay. Um, so that allows me to iterate through, I don't have to iterate through the entire struct. I can iterate through one column of it. Um, and I can, it, it's made things a lot more accessible and a lot uh, faster for sure. Um, but it's also interesting because 
you know what I've, I, by doing this, I've somewhat, by, by making it indexable by just number, uh, I've basically removed the usefulness of the Rust borrow checker, which is, you know, one of the best parts about Rust programs. Mm, okay. The, the Rust what checker? The Rust borrow checker. Okay. It's, uh, if you've heard the Rust uh, has this idea of linear types, which is that you can't, um, or it basically tracks to make sure that you only have one reference to any given variable at any given time. Um, yeah, I, I, I know the problem. Okay. Yeah. So if you index, um, so if, if I were, if I had a whole bunch of structs of events, then each of those events could be borrow checked so that I only reference one at a time or each event is only referenced once at a time. But if I have events are actually just numbers and those numbers can go and index their data in this graph, um, then, you know, rest is not going to check these in borrow, check these numbers, these indices. So I basically removed, you know, the good parts and the safety parts of rust. And this starts to look like I'm just programming C code. <laughs> it's funny because there's actually, that's what like this whole data oriented design movement is about. Like you see it most in, in game engine design, they call it the entity component system. And it's, it's basically this design right here. Instead of having a list of structs, have a struct of lists. And um, people use it all the time. It speeds their code up, but you know, it really makes me wonder if I'm like going back in circles or what, because, you know. Right. You went to Rust to get away from C++ and now you find yourself uh, going back again. Yeah, it really makes you wonder. Um, yeah. Well, anyways, so yeah, you can see through allocating, like I use some unsafe uh, logic to set the size of the vectors initially. Um, but yeah, so I was, I was going through, and I don't have to get so deep into this, but basically just, I, at first I thought I was gonna be able to reduce this to when you add an event, it's an N cubed uh, complexity because you're basically computing the reachability from every node to every other node so that you can find um, if the new event, what the new event can see and what it can strongly see all at the same time. Um, and that's called the Floyd Warshall algorithm. I think I have it written down here, but it's commented out or something. Oh, the reachability matrix. So this is gonna compute, it's gonna return a matrix that says that what every event can see to every other event. Uh, and that's an o, o of n cubed algorithm. But then I realized, well, you actually don't need to see every other event, what every other event can see. You only need to see, you can uh, store what every other event can see, like cache it, and then just compute what the new one can see in relation to this old matrix. And that could be done with Kruskal's algorithm, or something which is O of n squared. So we've already gotten, you know, reduced by one polynomial <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, degree. What was the name of that first algorithm? Uh, uh, the flow yeah. or Floyd? Floyd Warshall. Okay. Yeah. And this one's Kruskal or Prims or Dijkstra's. Dijk How do you spell Dijkstra? I know it has a J in it. DJ. Okay. Dijkstra. Um, yeah, so these are all algorithms for just computing uh, reachability from just one event rather than all events. Um, or nodes, because nodes are events. And uh, from this point, I, uh, I realized that well, actually, I don't have to compute even that because if I have the reachability 
uh, information cached from uh, from the self parent and the other parent of this new added event, I can basically just or those like bit strings together. So I can everything that my self parent or my other parent can see. I know that this new event can see and nothing more. That's like the transitive closure property of this graph. So oring together two bit strings is actually just O of n and a fast O of n because they're bit strings. Yeah. So that's uh Okay. Um Yeah, I think that's where this reachable from function is doing is basically uh getting the two parents if they exist and then uh pouring together the bit strings and caching them. So, so with the second version uh, in, in, um, in Rust, did you see a performance improvement over your first, uh, your first draft? Yeah, I haven't gotten to play with it a ton, honestly. As I said, I wrote this a few days ago and I'm still not even totally sure it's completely working. I haven't gotten to test a bunch, but if I run this test, okay, let's see. Um, so yeah, in the test, I'm doing this random walk, which is basically just randomly sending events around. So if I do, uh, let's do 200 steps and time in. Okay. Let's do 300 steps. Well, no. Okay. So if we want to compare it to the other one, we got to do something that it can reasonably manage. Okay. So that's 0 0.032 uh, real, 0 0.023 for the user. So this is the one that we want to look at. If we uh, pull up my old code. Hmm. <clears throat> random walk. Okay, so we'll set 200 steps here. Cargo build. <laughs> Dang, I may have broken this one locally. Mm. Um, benchmark unknown time function. At, uh, huh. So undeclared module time. Um, I don't know how easy this is going to be for me to. Well, okay, it's fair to say that this probably took maybe two seconds in this version. So the speed up to point oh two is, you know, a hundredfold. <laughs> um, oh, okay. So, so significant improvement. You, you reached finality or become famous in, in the, uh, your second draft uh, was two seconds or wh in, which the, in the first one to, to basically to build a graph that is to have randomly, uh, validators send events to other validators and determine everything about fame and uh, witness uh, to, to build a 200 event graph that took two seconds in the original one and it takes about 0.023 oh, okay in the new one yeah that yeah that is um significant wow yeah 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 it's a lot faster okay yeah yeah, when you said uh, you, you have concerns about whether or not you've broken something in Rust, uh, sure. and, it, and it's related to the, 
the use of pointers, the way Russ handles pointers. Mm -hmm. And so how would you test that? Would you, would you, that, that, that would manifest itself in composition errors, right? Yeah. Um, I'm not totally sure what composition errors are. You want to expand on that? Uh, well, uh, it would also break concurrency, wouldn't it? If you had an environment where in concurrency problems are, are hard to, um, create. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. This one, um, yeah, let me think about that for a second. You're, you're right. Yeah. It definitely makes reasoning about concurrency harder. Um, and I mean, this is the, the complaint that like your veteran C and C++ programmers will have with Rust developers and, you know, the community around this language. They say you don't need all these safety checks. You just have to write good code. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Um, those, those are the, 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 really, the really good programmers say that. Right, yeah, yeah. And I'm sure, you know, a few slip by them. Um, but... Yeah, I mean, if you can design it well the first time, which is, you know, what I'm trying to do here, it, it's definitely true that they don't have the same safety under concurrency by default. But the idea is that you want to write all these kind of unsafe paradigms and data-oriented design, and then you want to abstract it into, you know, kind of an abstract data type that uh, people can interface with through a, a few specific functions and those functions, you know, can ensure safety. Um, so like, for example, uh, rather than just indexing into whatever row that you want here, uh, I specifically have something called an index allocator. Um, and that's going to always allocate right now just whatever I plus one is or whatever the current iterate, whatever the current uh, number that we're on plus one. Um, but later I can basically turn this into like a runtime garbage collector where if an event say was acting uh, in a bad way, then we could actually remove that from the graph. And, you know, now we're backstepping. So maybe we're deleting old graphs or, you know, when we get to the end, we're running through the beginning again. Um, so like you, you wouldn't want the user to directly index these values because you don't know if there's really anything there or not, or if it's a valid index anymore. So if you write this interface for people to use, um, as for concurrency, something like that, something where you'd use some kind of atomic reference to get into the graph itself, rather than making the graph inherently concurrent, like would be done, uh, you know, in the previous project or by default in Rust. But yeah, it, it makes it a lot tougher to reason about. I've got a question um, in relation to uh, our chain and the current issue that they're working through is, as far as uh, long proposed times. So in, in Casper, you have this issue of where uh, you have one validator whose justifications are um, well, there's there's a lack of uh, liveliness, uh, meaning their uh, liveliness is being where they're all kind of sh sharing uh, information and, and getting justifications through other uh, other parents. Uh, so the, these long proposed proposed times are where you have a, a a validator who's not being social, and their their justifications are from their their own their own chain so they're able to as they call it, rabbit or kind of move ahead of the other validators and the other validators are kind of slow and it, it takes times to process a, a, a transaction and then they also have to try to catch up which they never do so um, it, it so in the world of hash graph uh, you know I'm kind of relate re relating so so here's here's an issue in the world of Casper, which is hap happening. How how would that situation uh, translate into the world of Hashgraph or 
doesn't even even happen to where if you have um, a validator who who sees um, I'm trying to you know, use the terminology in the in the hash graph world <clears throat> I guess justifications is is it possible in the hash graph world for one validator to kind of rabbit ahead or get ahead of all the other validators and then you have uh, a group of validators who are s slow and who 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 start to um, fall behind is 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 mm -hmm. that so just just so I understand it right you have a validator that's not uh, communicating with the other ones it's like not sending out its justifications and therefore it doesn't have to process as much information so it's able to stay up to date yeah so it's it's it 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 and and that's where I, I'm <clears throat> I'm not quite clear on what why one validator is exactly racing ahead of the others, but it's my, that's my understanding is that there's a, a lack of liveliness or, uh, you know, this, uh, this justification comes from where you're, you, you can justify your, uh, your, your, your next block based on uh, justification of other blocks. Uh, and, and of course those justifications are placed on uh, other blocks of other validators. Um, yeah. so, so it, it so, I, it, so what, what they've done to remedy the issue is they, they've enforced this element of liveliness to where if you have one validator who's racing ahead, uh, so what, what happens is when, when at the Genesis block for the first 2000 blocks, the, the consensus is speedy. It, it moves along quite well. But once you get up to 2000 blocks, then things start to slow down. You get these long proposed times. And um, so what the, what they're doing is they're, they're putting in um, this error correcting code, these constraints to where they're telling the one validator that um, uh, we're going to prevent you from racing ahead. We're uh, we're going to throttle back the performance in order to allow the slower validators to catch up, and it's going to. They're forcing the the the, the rabbit validator to um, forcing liveliness. It's forcing them to when they get their justifications, they have to get justifications from other validators. Uh, and, 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 and that, so once the slower validators catch up, then the throttling stops and then it, it moves, then the, <clears throat> then the, the proposed times go down from, um, five minutes back down to 30 seconds. So the, the performance in, increases considerably. Hmm. So, so, th so this, this was a, you know, a big issue for the past couple of weeks in the world of our chain, uh, addressing the, um, uh, uh, actually if, if two weeks, if not longer addressing the, the long proposed times and, you know, and I have understanding of how they're, they're the, the, the mechanism they're using incorporating to, um, to, to, to resolve the issue. So, so that's in the world of, of Casper and, uh, and I guess it, you know, I, I'm just thinking, you know, in the world of hash graph, um, is 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 this uh, is there some form of error correcting code that's uh, uh, well, and and maybe I'd, I'd, I'd that's where my limitations of hash graph starts to come uh, come in to where you know is it possible for one validator to to march ahead based on you know their their justifications, you know, if they're not if there's a lack of liveliness, they're not getting justifications from other validators uh, that they're having to validate. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm just imagining here, like, or if we use the colored one, like if, um, you know, this validator say it's not being live, it's not, uh, so it's receiving events from other validators and then it's just choosing to ignore them. It's not actually, gossiping about that um so i mean like if we pretend that you know this line here was removed then 
Yeah, well, so that would be that would be an interest. So that's kind of you know this uh, this lack of gossiping. So that's that's one mechanism that Hashgraph has is the the gossiping and the gossiping about gossip. If there's one validator that's not playing their part is in the gossiping, then there's a built-in constraint to to kind of um, address that issue. Well, yeah, that's that's what I'm wondering right now, actually. Um, just walking through that example, if if we can see that, uh, let's see if it's provable um, to show that I like for this guy to say I sent uh, this guy on the left some event, and if his next event doesn't contain this one, um, I don't know if there's actually a way to you know prove that uh, that I sent my event and he received it, you know, he could just pretend he never saw it. And then in that case, he's basically not being live. He's not participating in what he doesn't want to participate in. Um, you know, maybe he's selectively, uh, passing on what he wants to pass on. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I mean, in that case, and maybe I'm sure Lehman Baird have, has, consider this um more than i have for sure mm -hmm. but yeah it seems like there is a, a potential f to like lack that liveness and you know gossip about gossip is the justifications it's the same thing as the casper justifications okay. so um you know instead of receiving it all at once this whole list that you need to go check and like in casper you're just receiving uh one other parent and that other parent may be linked to other data, but uh, they're, they're very similar ideas. Um, one thing I do know about in Hashgraph is that really when you have this implemented correctly, it's really an O of one operation because you have uh, the concept of rounds. I don't know if Casper has rounds. I don't think it does. It just has the, the greediest, heaviest observed uh, for choice rule ghost. Um, but yeah, well, hash we, we don't, we don't have, have but, but, uh, Greg is now introducing, you know, the, the concept of a game and, you know, you think of a, a player and the opponent. So, you know, you're a player and everybody else is the opponent. And we alter, we have to alternate now between player and opponent for every, um, for every justification. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Like you're treating whoever the justification is from as the uh, player and you're the opponent. A potential may be somebody who is the interesting. Remember the, the, the leader or the leaderlessness of it. Uh, I'm trying to. Yeah, and I and I I get lost as well. Um, I I I believe you know there there hasn't been much discussion as far as you know identifying a leader. So I tend to think the answer is no. Yeah, I mean it's a it's a block DAG. So I mean just based on that, I would say that there's not really a place for a leader because. You know, if there were a leader, then only one new block could be proposed at any given time. You'd have a, a block chain, what I understand. But that's something that is um, a, a apparent uh, exists in the in the Hashgraph world is the notion of a leader. No, Hashgraph is leaderless. Also. Leaderless as well. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I think pretty much anything that's a DAG like this is going to be leaderless, um, as far as I know. Okay. But I suppose the, the you know the uh, alternation is uh, sort of like uh, uh, you lead then follow, you lead then follow, you lead then follow. 
Um, yeah, but that's really a, a leader based, you know, like if you look at some of the slightly older, like two year old consensus algorithms, like Tendermint, um, and you know, some of the original proof of stake ones, those are all like round robin leader based where you can deterministically but randomly determine the uh, proposer of a block for the next round based on the previous round. Yeah, no, this is this is just in terms of you know the rabbits um, delaying proposing until someone else proposes. Mm. Well, well, the the way I understood it is if you if you propose a block. You can't use that block as the next, you, you know, you can't use that block as your first justification for the next block. Is that, is, does it still sound leaderless? It, it gives kind of a round robin effect, but, but you're saying that's, that's still leader based. No, that shouldn't be. I mean, that the rule on its own doesn't really tell you if it's leader based or not, but I mean, the fact that anybody can propose a block and then really all you're doing is justifying that block to see if it's valid and then building on top of it if you decide that it's valid. Um, you know, there, there's no specific leader ever chosen or no specific uh, proposer ever chosen. Just anybody can propose a block on top of another one that they deem valid. So... That, that I would say is definitely leader leaderless. Yeah. Jay, you just mentioned something that I wasn't aware of, that there was this whole generation of uh, consensus uh, models before the, the onset of uh, Casper and, and Hashgraph. And you mentioned uh, Tendermint. And, you know, I've heard this word Tendermint before, but I, you know, I can't tell you what, in what context. Uh, so, so that that is an example of uh, a first. Is it like the first generation consensus models, or is there such yeah. a thing? Yeah, I think you would call it second generation. I mean, if you're talking about like blockchain technology or whatever, and like the kind of marketing around it, it was it was called second generation, like along with um, EOS and um, Neo. And these kind of blockchains, like Neo is delegated proof of stake, okay. uh, but it, it ran on a similar model of round robin uh, leader based mm -hmm. proposals. Uh, and, and all of those algorithms are based on, uh, what's his name? Leslie Lamport's Paxos algorithm. Okay. Paxos Lamport. I can post a, a link to this in this channel. But it's basically a, a way to reach consensus based it, it, the Paxos algorithm itself is like the most fundamental way to reach consensus with by proposing a leader okay so and in Paxos would so that would that be generation one of consensus models yeah I mean Paxos was written in Okay, this is Paxos made simple. Paxos, I'm pretty sure, was written in the 50s or 60s. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, you know, this is helpful of, you know, getting this historical view oh, of... This is, this is what I've never heard of. I, I, this is interesting. Yeah. yeah, this, yeah. It, it makes me smarter understanding the history, how, how we got here. You know, that's... I don't know exactly what's going on in, in this world where I'm in, and but understanding how we got here is 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 helpful so uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I just kind yeah. of arrived but uh uh so so paxos so that's interesting that it was something going back to the 50s now uh, and, and that's helpful for me knowing that hey somebody's been out there thinking about consensus and consensus algorithms since the 50s i'm like oh okay so we've been working on this for a little while so. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm the same way. You know, I'm 
I'm not coming from like a background education and consensus. I, I first was interested in blockchain and that made me look back, be like, where did this actually start? Yeah. Right. And it, that kind of makes sense, you know, because back in the fifties, you know, that's where, you know, all the, 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 the computers were really starting, you know, after the world war two, uh, you know, the, 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 the computers were, were starting coming into their, uh, their time. So there was still, you know, machine language back in, in those days, but th there were people back there trying to even thinking about, you know, consensus uh, um, uh, among computers. So that's, that's interesting. Yeah. And again, it, it was, it's um, somewhat primitive compared to now. And I don't know if primitive is the right word because there's still cases in which you would want to use Paxos and not, uh, say Casper and in fact Google uses Paxos for I think it's um, whatever it's distributed uh, storage system is mm -hmm. it's kind of like Amazon Sanity B. Well, you know um, it would be interesting you know this is our consensus hour maybe next week or the week after uh, maybe it, it, for all of us to, to kind of go and read the wiki page on Paxos and come back and and talk about it you know it is you know that was the the beginning of it all and and just to have that historical vantage point of you know how it all started and to talk about you know Paxos what it is and you know what whether it was simple or complex what problem it was trying to solve and then kind of work through the you know the history of of uh, consensus so you know from Paxos gave us you know what and then you know when did so that's you know maybe like the first generation and then when did se second generation come come on board uh, and and how how they're all kind of related yeah it's funny I'm actually preparing for a talk next Thursday here in Austin um, where I'm basically giving a, a history of consensus algorithms Jay, that would be, hey, you've got an audience right here. If you want to, and, and hey, to be a good public speaker, it's all about practice. So you can use us as your uh, your prep audience. Yeah, yeah, maybe so. I mean, it'll be next Thursday and uh, next Consensus Lab is Friday. But oh, Okay, well, we'd be interested in uh, maybe uh, how long is your presentation? It's about an hour long. Well, we, um, uh, if you, well, I know it's the day after, but I'd I'd be interested in uh, listening to your presentation. Uh, you know, and you can tell us how it went. Uh, so maybe yeah, we can put, yeah. that, put that on and, the agenda for next next Friday. Yeah, and, and a lot of it is stuff that you guys would know too, and that we've talked about here today. So, um, I was also going to link this other paper by Leslie Lamport. That I have not read yet, but I've been meaning to. I've heard a lot of good stuff about it. Uh, he really goes into like the fundamental concepts behind what it means to order events or, or what it means to have an ordering of events in a distributed system. Okay. Now, now, do you have a pitch deck prepared for your consensus uh, presentation? Oh, yeah. I mean, I have some slides prepared that I'm going to okay. go off. Well, you know, I'm I'm here in the the Tampa Bay area, and we have a a blockchain community called Block Spaces, and um, you know we have meetups, you know, during the week, and you know people come in and talk about you know a particular coin or a particular you know topic, or but it would be you know for me after you know kind of sitting you know learning about consensus as much as I uh, have, you know maybe borrowing or leveraging some of your presentation uh, for a local uh, consensus uh, meetup, uh, that, that would be, you know, that would be kind of neat, you know, that, that, that's, um, so hey, may, maybe yeah. I can uh, breathe more, breathe life it, uh, into uh, your presentation here in another, another, uh, another state. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll link it uh, in the chat maybe this weekend and, yeah, I mean, it, as much mileage as I can get out of the, you know, <laughs> rel I don't know, you know, as to what I'm putting into it, that'd be great. Okay, yeah. And then uh, maybe we'll even, uh, if, if, if all of that comes to fruition, you know, we, sometimes we record our, 
our presentations and uh, we, we record them and put them, post them on Facebook. So if, uh, if all that, you know, does happen, then I'll, I'll, we'll try to, you know, make, make that happen as well. So you can, you can kind of see the fruits of your labor. <laughs> see someone yeah. Yeah. i that was he that's my presentation that's my baby so cool well you know this this is uh kind of a, a, a different tack than what we're usually uh going you know we we usually talk about the the technical aspects of of casper but you know i you know i'm kind of a history buff and you know i enjoy you know the history of things so even though in this world of computers and science there's a history there and uh and uh gary's all right gary talk to you later so um yeah so that's it it's it's uh i find it all all uh, interesting and fascinating so yeah, so we you know we 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 can kind of have uh, agenda items for the next uh, two or three weeks. Oh, okay. So uh, I don't even know what time. What do you it think is. of the uh, con the stellar consensus? Stellar, and I'm not even familiar with. Uh, that was, uh, 2015. All right, Jay. Hey, thanks, Jay. I, we appreciate it. Oh, Jay's leading. Okay. Um. Speaking of stellar and lumens, did you get your uh, your space drop? Did you get your yeah. uh, good for you? And Peter. Hey, Peter. Uh, everyone just left, Peter. <laughs> oh, so we you're an hour, hour late. <laughs> well, that was for that was for consensus, and you know we kind of uh, move into uh, process calculi. So actually, when it comes to process, process calculi, he's right on time. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, perfect timing. Um, but. Uh, we're, we're kind of uh, few in number this morning, so uh, we're, we're kind of um, uh, do, struggling for discussion topics. Um, and I, I don't really have any for process calculi. Computational calculi? Or computational calculi, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, w uh, I was hoping to talk about uh, uh, okay back in 2015 when uh, uh, David uh, Mazzara is at Stanford came up with his uh, an algorithm that was Byzantine fault tolerant it, uh, it was counted as being the first uh, consensus protocol that was proven to be Byzantine false tolerant oh, okay this was much after Paxos Okay, right. Um, uh, uh, I'm not sure uh, 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 how that uh, related, but um, this protocol it was like formally proved or something, or um, yeah, he did a formal proof. And it's funny that, that you know, the, the, uh, I remember at the time in 2015, this was a big deal because this was going to uh, this was going to uh, compete with uh, Bitcoin, um, and uh, uh, now it's uh, a live payment network that's uh, quite functional and. Uh, So what does this live payment network have a name? Is it uh Stellar. Oh <laughs> okay, I see where you're you were going. I, I missed the punchline. Um gotcha. Yeah, okay. He, this professor was a co-founder okay. of Stellar Network. Uh, okay. Which was uh which was uh, uh supported by Stripe. 
and somebody else. Uh, Stripe Payment Network. Right. Okay. Uh, and so, uh, uh, if you sign, uh, we 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 uh, signed into Keybase and got free uh, uh, free lumens. Free Peter, stuff. Peter, do you have a Keybase account? Are you familiar with Keybase? Keybase.io. Mm, so I I know that it exists, but I don't have. Thank you. Well, they have a, a promotion going on. It's a, it's a giveaway. They're, they have, uh, over the next year to two years, they're giving away $116 worth of Stellar Lumens. So uh, those of us um, in Colab who have a Keybase account, uh, this past week we all received approximately $20 worth of Stellar Lumens. So uh, if you're so if you're interested, you can create a Keybase account by going to Keybase.io, and you'll be um, uh, account holder. So next month in October, um, uh, provide you go through the authentic authentication process, you can get approximately twenty dollars or less of uh, Stellar Lumens in into your account. So you can buy yourself lunch. Or buy buy a few beers. Nice. Thanks for the information. Yeah. And you know, um, it's a a great way to uh, to pay people. And there's hundreds of thousands of accounts. And uh, I guess uh, you know you're not going to pay a lot of bills with twenty one dollars, but uh, it's you know uh, uh, you know it is uh, a. Uh, uh, an alternative to Bitcoin that's really easy for people to use. Um, and if you create an account, uh, they have, uh, Keybase also has groups and we've created a group called Rolang. So you're welcome to uh, join the Rolang group as well. Yeah. It, they, they have other services besides the Stellar payment system is uh, they have well, we have uh, uh, strong uh, identity or proofs. I guess you know that proofs uh, uh, that, that you own certain accounts or domains or whatever. Um, and then uh, it has uh, a secure chat and uh, 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 chat rooms, uh, decentralized file storage, uh, secure. So uh, it's really the best uh, uh, current alternative for secure uh, uh, communications as well as identity. So is this you know, key base uh, service, right? You're talking about? Right, that's all, all key base. Uh, cool. Yeah, it's all key base. Mm -hmm. Uh, if I can uh, jump to a bit different topic for a second, I wasn't present for uh, like two weeks or something, and uh, yeah, I was wondering if there are topics for yeah, like what what is happening currently at uh, collaborative uh, consensus and um, the computation calculi uh, meetings. There are particular topics discussed or yeah. So last week we discussed. Um, well, tip, a lot of times, what we do is we we watch the R chain, R cast, or not watch it, but listen to it. So uh, I think uh, the current we have. I haven't listened to the current one that's out there. It's forty one or forty two, but um, so you're you can listen to the R chain R casts, uh, and and Greg. I think last week. Uh, Greg spoke about rewriting, and um, Jim, help me out here. It was rewriting in something or another. Uh, it, it, it was it was very technical. Yeah, it was, uh, the, yeah, it was uh, right. What was the uh, title of rewriting in der the derivative? Uh, oh, rewriting in derivatives. So you know, I listened to the the Rcast. I didn't really have a good 
understanding of why I was even listening to it. Ian Dufresne, who was on the call, part of the conversation, uh, he led our discussion last week, and you know he 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 helped kind of walk us through it uh, the best he could. But you know he he didn't have a you know the perfect grasp of it. Uh, so you're you can go back to you can go to the collab um, channel on YouTube and watch our previous uh, consensus and computational calculi sessions. And the, the, so that would be the most recent one uh, where we're, we talk about the uh, rewrite rules and derivatives. But if you don't, if you can't understand it, and don't, you know, don't understand how it, how it fits in or what it has to do with anything, I'm right there with you because uh, it, was, it was all over my head. Um, I wish I was smarter on that. But, uh, and before that, you know, there was probably, you know, I think we were talking about um, s square root consensus. I had a little better understanding of what that was about. We had, we had the, the week before we did uh, 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 a uh, simple, we, we reviewed a simple implementation of Casper and Rust. Um, what? Yeah, that was uh, who? That was that with, with did Jay? Uh, yeah, I think Jay. Jay presented that. The uh, okay. Uh, but if you look here, we had uh, uh, and that was uh, uh, you know what's nice about. Uh, Peter, what's nice about watch, watching the videos as opposed to being here live is when someone says something you don't understand it, you can hit the rewind button and listen to it again. And sometimes I have to listen to it two or three times to, to, to get it to sink in. But when I'm sitting here live and someone says something, if I didn't get it, that's too bad. It just conversation goes on. So that, there are certain advantages to you know, being in the, uh, in the YouTube world. Yeah. But they, uh, I guess Joshi presented the true level Casper. Okay, true level Casper. Okay. And oh. then, uh, computational calculus. So help me to remember this, Jim. So true level Casper was written in Rust. Is that correct? Yeah. And 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 who, who, what's what was the? Oh, that was uh, the. That that was the. Uh, True level, that's the company that um, Vlad Zamfir is funding to write, come up with the Casper in Rust for Ethereum. Okay. Uh, no. uh, is it? Um, I, yeah. I, I didn't know that, no. Well, yeah. maybe not. I don't know. Okay. I know this particular implementation was uh, you know, just a simple, naive implementation. Oh, okay. It could be that they, you know, that they're doing a uh, a more sophisticated implementation. Okay. Based on this, but no, this is sort of a prototype. Uh, I didn't know that True Light was associated with. Uh, well, I'm I'm making that assumption given that uh, Vlad, he's an independent researcher for Ethereum, so I. I I, I would imagine that's the focus of his attention is uh, Ethereum, just like our chain is, is trying to come up with a, a proof of stake consensus model. And, you know, he, he's, he's one of the researchers working on it for Ethereum. So they're not there yet. So I imagine he's trying to uh, recruit other resources in order to make that happen. Um, you know, Ethereum, they're, they're up and running and working for, you know, for a few years now, but on proof of work. And they're trying to make this uh, transition to this world of proof of stake, and they want to do it by the beginning of next year. Right. Uh, and, you know, how, you know, how that's going to happen and, you know, how it's going to work remains to be seen. You know, but we're here in our chain world, we're we're not up and running yet, but that day is fast approaching, and you know we, we have our our version of the proof of stake 
uh, consensus and we're feeling pretty good about it. So we're going to be up and running here shortly. So, um, um, so for Peter, Peter's information, uh, so we're in s middle of September now. So October 24th is a, is the uh, annual our chain uh, membership meeting in Seattle, Washington. So uh, this will be the third year, I believe, uh, of uh, the annual membership meeting. Um, and and it's, so the people will be there pr uh, physically present in Seattle, Washington, but in the past they've also done Zoom sessions. So you can, uh, from wherever you are in the world, um, watch it live streamed. So it's, it's nice. like being there. Nice. So you you want to uh, kind of uh, be in tune for in uh, are uh, for if you're interested in in the uh, that October twenty fourth meeting. Are are you Peter? Are you a uh, Archain co op member? Are you Ooh. part of the uh, the Archain co op by chance, or are you just associated with the the collab? I'm not. Uh, I'm just uh, associated with uh, Colab. Colab. I, I was invited by. Um, oh, I forgot the name. That's embarrassing. Uh, Tomislav. Oh, right. Oh, Tomislav. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so, are you in Croatia as well? No, we met in Poland on a Pascal conference. Uh, that was. Uh, oh, okay. In this what part of the world are, are you in? I'm from Poland. So oh, like... you're in Poland. Well, you know, it's funny you should mention that because uh, several members of our core development team are in Poland. Uh, yeah, I believe Pavel Schultz uh, from, um, I don't know what he's doing, but he was yeah. in uh, uh, Aircast. Uh, yeah, he's from Poland. I believe he now lives in uh, USA, but no, he, he's from Poland. Yeah, yes, he is. And there, there's there's about five or six other uh, developers that are in Poland as well. So uh, yeah, you're in you're in you're in good company. Um, so uh, yeah, so if um, so if if you're interested in learning more about our chain. Um, that's always, you know, uh, an, an avenue to take is, uh, so be, by, when you, when you become an R chain, uh, co-op member, you have access to the R chain, uh, discord. And there's a lot of conversations that go along in there, uh, as far as the, um, the development of, of R chain. Um, so, and things are getting more exciting now because, uh, we're 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 on our testnet two, and we'll be soon moving to testnet three, and then by uh, our October twenty fourth, our our uh, annual membership meeting, or there shortly thereafter, we'll be at mainnet, and um, so it's it's going to be a whole different world for uh, for the R chain uh, people involved in R chain, so um, and it's. And, and um, yeah, so, uh, and, and of course, our chain is uh, using a lot of the concepts and uh, tools that we talk about in CoLab as far as, you know, the consensus models and the process calculi and, you know, it's, it's all, um, it all kind of comes together in the world of our chain and all the components that, that make it up, that make up the platform. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the information. So, uh, you are referring to this. Um, there is a big button on the web page, join cooperative. Right. So it, it's you know it's a fairly you know nominal fee. It's it's an annual fee. I think it's twenty U.S. dollars. But that uh, then you become official. Uh, you become a, a a member of the R chain cooperative uh in 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 a, a co-op is a little different from a traditional business um you know i think of you know co-ops here in the united states we have what's called farm co-ops you know it's a collective of farmers who get together 
uh, and they, when they purchase grain or, you know, farm equipment, they, they purchase it as a, as a collective. So, but we're in technology. It's a little, little bit different, but that's the idea that it's a, uh, the organization is made up of the community members, which have input into the um, organization or the, the, the vision and the, and the, the roadmap of, of, of the co-op. So, uh, you know, there's, you know, uh, trans transparency. We try to be as transparent and inclusive uh, as possible. So it's, it's, a, it's a different structure. You know, I, I worked for the phone company for a number of years. You know, a phone company uh, is very centralized. And, you know, you have manager, the president, managers, and everything is very structured. Co-op is totally different. You know, it's instead of a, a vertical structure, everything's very flat. You know, it's it's the community becomes sort of the 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 boss. Um, so it's uh, and and because of that, it, you know, there's a certain dynamic that's um, uh, created within the organization as far as you know, people get very uh, passionate about their views. But uh, it, if if anything, it's very entertaining. So it's uh, it's uh, it, it's it's uh, a lot of uh, activity, and, and people get very uh, uh, a lot of liveliness. Nice. Uh, yeah. So, and you know, as far as um, all of the. Um, yeah, so that's that's kind of a, a sort of a general update. What from what we've been when go what's been going on? Uh, do you have um, in in uh, the, there's the the R chain or excuse me the collab uh, community calendar? Uh, so this this so Friday we have you know our consensus uh, sessions and now we're into. Um, uh, uh, process calculi, computational calculi, but there's other sessions during the week. Um, uh, you may or may not be interested in those, depending on your interest in R chain and, and Rolang. But here I can uh, post that calendar in the chat. Uh, I have access to calendar, I think. Do you? Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, so in the uh, Friday, uh, sorry, uh, Thursday, right? There is, you mentioned that there is a um, computation. No. Let's see. Um, on Thursday, I mean, I'm going to pull up the calendar as well. Well, I'm going to uh, drop off. Oh, okay. Uh, to you guys, uh, hopefully uh, next time, uh, come an hour earlier for uh, the uh, consensus collab, and uh, uh, maybe uh, and uh, uh, although sometimes we only have a topic in the computational calculus or in Casper, but uh, uh, normally the uh, the hour before this is. Uh, on consensus, and this hour is on computational calculus. Mm -hmm. I will try to. Uh, Take care now. Yeah, Bye -bye. see you, Jim. See you.